is a new section. Um, I've been working on ontology now for 34 years. First 20 years or so, I was working on ontology from a philosophical point of view. And more recently, as I think everyone knows, I've been working on ontology in computer-related applications. Most computer-related application ontologies fail. They have short lives. And the reasons for this are um, uh, multiple. So funding runs out. The, some ontology project somewhere else fails, and so the people who are funding your ontology project get cold feet, and they pull the funding. There are reason, a whole host of reasons of that sort. Um, now, why do we need ontologies nonetheless, even though they mostly fail? Well, this is a, an enterprise data model for a big uh, industrial enterprise, and it is... Um, Highly problematic because if people in the top right hand corner who are experts in the databases in the top right hand corner need to exchange data with the people in the bottom left corner, they typically can't do it. You can only exchange data and create interoperability between data systems if people know well the data systems which need to be brought into connection with each other. And typically, people know well only one small corner of the data available in a large enterprise. Now, the most um, important reason for being interested in ontology in the industrial world is to address this problem, that if you can describe your data using ontologies, publish the ontologies, then people in the bottom left can find out what the data in, in the top right is about because they'll be using the same ontology as the people in the bottom left. So that's what the need is. So you, in order to extract meaning from a large body of data like this, you need to know what the data tables are about. And it, this gets worse when one organization needs to exchange data with another completely separate organization. Then you have real problems. The goal of the Industrial Ontologies Foundry is to create a suite of ontologies that will solve that problem, not just within one single enterprise, where it's already a big problem, but across multiple enterprises. All right, now, ontology is, is regarded by some people, still enough people, as a solution, potential solution. So there are still, as is proved by the people in this room, people with optimistic views about the possibility of ontology to succeed. And ontology, I believe, is succeeding in the oboe foundry context. And I'm going to try and give the reasons for that. So, how does ontology succeed? Well, I think that the reason is that we utilize natural language. We create controlled vocabularies, computable lexica. And because natural language changes relatively slowly, and because natural language is understandable to large numbers of people, then if we describe our data tables using natural language, that will mean that people will know the content of the data table without much further ado. The natural language itself, of course, is not enough. What we need is to link the data tables together in a computational environment. And so we need not just natural language structured vocabularies, we need computable structured vocabularies. And that's where OWL comes in. OWL provides a framework which allows us to have a controlled, structured language, which is also cool. And OWL makes the computable lexica flexible. It makes them relatively easy to extend and to join together. And you can, when you join together, you can check the consistency. And that's why OWL is so useful, because it's decidable. You can check the consistency immediately. All right, so this is the early ontology background. So OWL1 came into existence in 2004. It, it was a W3C artifact, still is a W3C artifact. Protégé came into existence in 1999. There were various efforts before that. Um, 
the existence of property created a huge number of ontologies. One of the reasons why ontologies nearly always fail is that there are so many ontologies written by people who are not really very good at building ontologies because protege makes it so easy that a lot of them were designed to fail just because they were not built by people who knew what they were doing. All right, now, the three main reasons, leaving aside funding and boredom and so forth, are The first reason is the silo syndrome. People think you just need to build an ontology for your own problem or your own community, and so you create a silo. And as soon as your community joins with another community or gets new members or new data, your ontology breaks. And the second reason is that ontology is built very often for the data you have. And if you do that, as soon as you get more data, your ontology will break. Because it wasn't built for that new data. And the third reason is the reinvent the wheel syndrome. So everyone thinks that they can build an ontology. It's not really very hard work. You have a, a protege, you can just giggle with a protege and you get an ontology. Some people think just an OWL file already is an ontology. Some people think just an XML file is an ontology. But actually, there are principles which we now understand pretty well and which are accepted by all the people working in successful ontology projects, and which some of which I'm going to be describing today. Some of them are incorporated into BFO. That's one of the reasons why BFO exists. All right, so let's look at the silo system. Uh, syndrome. So if you if you Google on naval ontology, you'll get dozens of ontologies like this. So they, these ontologies overlap, but they're not compatible with each other. They, they were each produced for one specific contract or one specific problem, and then they they someone published a paper, and then a year later you couldn't find any evidence that the ontology existed other than the paper that was published. Now, the sad thing is that this syndrome is present already in the W3C. So the W3C should be taking care of building sustainable ontology, which will work well together. But if you look at two of the main ontologies built by W3C, the provenance ontology has this as its top level. So, entity enroll, recipe, I don't know what recipe is, agent, and it might be fine for the purposes of provenance, but it looks like an odd set of upper level terms. And then if you go to the semantic sensor network ontology, you have a completely different set of upper level terms, feature of interest, place, quantity, kind, and so on. Those two ontologies do not fit because their top levels are completely different. And so you have to do extra manual work to make them fit, and that extra manual work is not is not representing something which is a structural feature of the ontologies. It's something bolted onto the side. What this means is that certainly SSN has undergone a rather complex evolution because it was not built in such a way that it would fit with other ontologies, not even with other W3C ontologies. And so we can't promote consistency of models, which is what the ontology uh, business is supposed to do. If the ontologies that we are required to use because they're WP recommendations are not consistent with each other. All right, now to continue with the history. So I believe that the one truly successful and sustainable effort within the ontology world thus far is the over boundary. So it's, it's been around now for 15 years, which is about 15 times longer than the average ontology. And the, the question is, what are the reasons for the success of the OVO family? And of course, one of the reasons is that it was the, the it was built on the gene ontology, and the gene ontology was the only scientific ontology available at a very important time in the development of biology, and it played a key role in the success of the Human Genome Project. So it was, it, it, there was a founder's effect. The first ontology in that particular domain had an, 
advantage over any subsequent ontology. And then there are other reasons. We've, we've been very lucky in getting sustained funding over a long period, precisely because of the importance of genomic data. But I think also the principles we used are a reason for the success. So, these are the principles. In order to counteract the silo problem, we build modules which are interoperable. We don't build ontologies separately. We build them as modules which fit the other ontologies we build, and that's what the Oval Foundry is. It's a set of modules built to work together. And to address the short half-life problem, we don't start with data. Data changes constantly. Data changes every time hardware changes. What we do is we build an ontology of the entity which the data are about. So we need to know the types of entities have data about, and then we build an ontology of those types, or classes, or universes, whatever you call them. And then to counteract the reinvent the wheel principle, we, we create and test principles for building ontologies, and we use the good ones, the ones that survive the test, which is what ISO 121838 is trying to do. It's trying to document principles which have Pass the test of time. So this is what it looks like. To have a successful sustainable ontology initiative, you, you have to have a hobbles focused approach. And then you have to choose the right hub. And so the right hub I am going to try and show is BFO. And I think everyone in this room more or less approves of that idea. BFO is very small, it changes very slowly. It's a re real top-level ontology, it has a lot of users, some of whom are very annoyingly active. It has a lot of ontologies built using it, and it has a lot of trained personnel who can use their expertise in multiple projects because they've been trained in principles which are shared by multiple projects. So this is another view of the modular approach. We have mid-level ontologies. Uh, many of the over family ontologies are mid-level ontologies, and then we have domain ontologies for specific diseases, for instance, or for specific surgical procedures, for specific kinds of data-related um, medical phenomena. And there are now around 300 ontologies reusing BFO. Nearly all of them have survived. Uh, some of them are now defunct. Uh, so be, using BFO is not a guarantee of, of having a long life. Um, most of these ontologies were for a long time biological or medically related. Now there are, as we saw, a, a, a number of ontologies in other areas. Uh, I believe that this is this development of use of BFO in other areas is going to expand. Uh, and now the fact that we have so many users using BFO in building ontologies brings about a virtuous snowball effect. So if you have an ontology based on BFO and you use it to annotate your data to make your data accessible, then that makes your data more valuable because it's accessible by people who understand the structure of ontology. But that makes BFO more valuable because in order to access that data, you need to learn BFO, and if you're going to learn it, you might as well use it for your own data, and that creates a virtuous snowball. The gene ontology is an example of that virtuous snowball. It got, it got bigger and better because the more people used it, the more it was useful to other people to use it also, which meant there were more requests for new terms to be added, which meant that it became more valuable, which meant that more people used it, and so on. All right, so modularity, which is the third key to success of the other foundry, brings many benefits. So, first of all, you, you get a division of labor. So the people who know about protein, who are really interested in protein, who have some kind of influence in the protein world, are the people who own the protein ontology. They have authority over the protein ontology. They own the domain. And we have a kind of homesteading principle. If you get there first, you own the domain unless you make a real mess of it and somebody else will do it better. Uh, this, this will 
motivate not just the owners of the ontology to do a good job, but also the users of the ontology to make sure that they do a good, good job by sending in requests or error uh, com or com error messages or complaints. The fact that we have modules means also that the ontologies are discoverable. Everyone knows which ontology is the ontology for protein because it's called the protein ontology. And then the fact that we have modules means that we can build this architecture in steps. We don't need to build it all at once. And then the fact that we have such a wide set of modules means that we do not have such a great need for mapping. So if you have a relatively small set of ontologies, and you need to have an ontology for another, reef, another realm, another domain, so you take an ontology from the outside, you then have to map the terms in that ontology to the terms used in your ontology, for instance, the upper level term, and that involves manual effort, it involves potentially breaking the validity of the definitions in the ontology that you're using. That need for mapping disappears if you have one ontology for each of the domains that you're interested in. All right, uh, now, Oh, the other side is the suites. There are many ontology suites. These are some examples. Um, the ones with yellow have hubs, which are top-level ontologies. Um, the suite suite, which is number three down the, uh, the left-hand column here, doesn't have a hub. It has sort of survived, but it's no longer maintained by the Jet Propulsion Lab, which created it. out, which suggested they're not having a, a successful time of it. And the semantic publishing and referencing ontologies, as far as I can see, is dead. The NEON project ontology, as far as I can see, that project too is dead. So the other projects sort of survived. To, to, certainly the Oboe Foundry survives. The Vivo project is uh, surviving. The Platinum project is surviving. The IDO project is not surviving very well, but now that we have the first order logic framework, we have an opportunity to revivify it because we can capture the definitions. Now, of the ontologies which have a top, the O is the top level, these are marked here. Um, and it's more or less the same list. There are others, for instance, the Industrial Ontologies Foundry. Um, but they're, they're relatively recent and they're still starting up, as it were. This is the paper in which the Ovo Foundry was introduced. This is a yet another view of the Ovo Foundry hub and spokes structure. So BFO is at the top. The information artifact controls the ontology for biomedical investigations. Probably we're going to have something called the Ovo Core, which will also be a mid-level ontology. And then we have the Ovo Foundry ontologies themselves down at the bottom. And this original architecture looked like this. So we have along the vertical axis granularity from molecules at the bottom to organs, organisms at the top, at, at the beginning anyway. And then along the top we have the BFO picture of the world, which we'll talk about later on, which distinguishes between objects, attributes, and processes, basically. We added another layer for complexes of organisms, populations, and so forth. We added, added an environment ontology, which covers all granularities in principle. And then we added OB, which is the ontology for biomedical investigations. And then we added the information artifact ontology, which is about things like publications and data. And then we published a book. So I think many people in the room have already seen this, but I'll hand it around. Now you see one, really. This, this book was published in 2015 by MIT Press, and the Chinese translation will appear within a year or thereabouts. So you can talk to Jia if you're interested. <laughs> 